I began early in the morning and doing some things and then the privilege of taking my boys to the batting cages and hitting a few balls, me and Stark out a few times too, uh, but hitting balls. And at the end, we were getting a few more tokens. The man came out and handed my boys two f- free tokens each and through a lesson was teaching them on the value of thankfulness, the value of being thankful. He actually made them thank me for <laughs> taking them there and uh, forced them to say some things. But, but it was a wonderful thing to be taught about thankfulness. Well, then I got my turn. Later in that day, one of our iPhones was broken. Later that day, I discovered that above our laundry room where one of the bathrooms is, there's a leak coming out of the bathtub. And a couple other things in the house where I was just frustrated. Frustrated to the point where I was just making sure my family knew that, you know, one of those deals. Uh, Von Kay was basically saying, uh, boys, don't talk to your dad right now. Uh, one of those deals. And, and then this verse popped in my head. I love how scripture, when you know it, pops into your head. Be thankful in all circumstances. Be thankful in all circumstances. Now, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to be thankful for broken phones and leaking ceilings. But I began to think about how I'm thankful that my family is healthy. I'm thankful that my daughter is on a youth trip with our church celebrating the glory of God. I'm thankful that I'm able to afford the fix to both the phone and to the leak. There's so many things to be thankful for. And so I just want you all to take a moment now and be thankful. You may have had a week like mine, which was yesterday, thankfully not all week, but you may have had a week like that. I just want you right now to just be thankful. To force yourself, if need be, to thank God for those things that you've maybe forgotten about, those blessings that you have, the breath in your lungs, the ability to walk into this building, the ability to to see your children grow, to see your spouse love you, to see that even when things are somewhat painful that God is still with you, whatever you need to just pull back a little bit and be thankful for, I encourage you to do that this morning. Let's take a moment. Be thankful. Father, we are thankful. Thank you, Father. So this week, we are continuing in our journey through the book of Nehemiah. We're going to pick up towards the end of chapter 2 and carry into a little bit of chapter 3. And during this time period where we find Nehemiah, if you remember, if you haven't, I'll catch you up. Uh, Nehemiah is away in the land of Persia, formerly in the land of Babylon, and his people, his fellow Hebrews, are approximately a thousand miles away, a little shy of that. And he understands through a messenger that his people are in great distress. Uh, The town itself is somewhat stable, yet the symbol of the security is no longer stable. The walls have been burned down and broken down. And he prays to God. He is fearful, but he goes into the presence of the king, the one for whom he bears the cup, and he asks for resources, and he asks for protection. And God added to his blessing not only what he asked for, but above and beyond that, abundantly more, we could say. And this is where we find Nehemiah. He is now traveling that journey that the messenger came to him. Now he's going the other way with the protection of the king of Persia, with all of the needs that he has, both financially and those that would protect him, the lumber, the soldiers, etc. We talked about last week how we can skip second. Some of you remember this. And we talk about that the, the first thing we need to do is pray, and the third thing we need to do is to act. But sometimes we skip that center thing, and that center thing is that we need to prepare. We need to prepare. And because of his preparation, Nehemiah was able to go into the situation with wisdom. We're going to find out that he he doesn't, we might say in modern terminology, a little crude perhaps, but but he doesn't spill the beans too quickly. He does not let the cat out of the bag too quickly. He does not show all his cards, use the metaphor you'd like to use, but he does not tell the whole story yet because he doesn't know who's going to be on board yet. And you're going to see some secrecy going on. And so let's go to Nehemiah chapter 2 and begin picking up where the journey left off last week. Chapter 2, verse 10, we're going to see some men we don't want to see again raise their heads. Then Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite, officially heard, official, heard about this. They were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. In other words, those people we don't like, we know people are coming to help and we don't like that. Nehemiah speaks up. 
first person. I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night. There's that secrecy. I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night examining the wall. Finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priest or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing this work. I love his optimism. <laughs> they will be doing this work, they just don't know it yet. Verse 17, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and that the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. So when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Gershom the Arab heard about that, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked? Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We as servants will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Elisha, the high priest, and his fellow priest went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated as far as the Tower of Haniel. The men of Jericho built the adjourning section, and Zaruch, Zarkur, son of Emery, built next to them. And so we find this wonderful record that Nehemiah sneaks in. He has protection, but he does not want to... Let it all out yet. He doesn't want to get rid of the surprise. He wants to see the lay of the land. He wants to see how it's going to work. In other words, before he talks to the people who are going to do the work, again, his optimism, he wants to be able to go in and say, here's what we're going to do, and this gate looks like this, and this gate looks like this, etc. And then, through preparation and prayer, now going to action, he goes to the people who will do this work, the, the, the people that will help him with this work. And so he does this very strategically, very strategically. And before we go on with the story, I want you to understand how we as Christians are those of you who are exploring what Christianity looks like, and if you're going to invite Jesus in your life, for the Christian, for the one through the Christian perspective, all of Scripture is God-breathed. All of Scripture is God-breathed. We understand from the Christian perspective that we must see the Old Testament through the lens of Christ. And so what I don't want you to do as we continue the book of Nehemiah is to just have a history lesson. Oh, oh cool, Nehemiah did this, and Nehemiah did this, and Nehemiah did this. What we're going to see is God's hand in Nehemiah, all this in the Old Testament pointing toward the restoration of Israel through Christ and the new Israel, his people, the people, the seed of Abraham, as we, as we find in Romans talking about the Gentiles, the, the non-Jews coming to Christ, going to come to God through Christ. And this is a great way to celebrate. So as we go through Nehemiah, again, this is not a history lesson only. We're going to learn some history, but we're going to see how God's protection for the people of old continues through the people of the new, historically, and the people of the day. That's important for us. And so as we do this, I want us to be reminded of key verses, one that we begin focusing on this year and will for the next couple of years, and one that's been a theme that will continue. And Henry mentioned the first one, uh, John chapter 15, verse 5, where Jesus says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will... You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, God says. You are the branches, believers. You're the branches. If you remain in me, that's our word for the year, remain. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, how do we do this? Well, let's go back to that Romans verse. It helps us understand how to do this in very practical approaches, which is why I like the translation here. As Peterson puts it in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He says, here's what I want you to do, God helping you. 
Here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. So how do you remain? How do you bear fruit? By taking your everyday, ordinary life and placing it before God. Sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, taking care of your kids, all whatever you do. All of this to the glory of God. Lay it, place it before God as an offering. And so we continue on in the story, and as we do so, I want us to look at what we see in chapters 2 and 3, what I'm going to call four categories of people. Four categories of people. As we go through these categories, what I want you to do is to identify them with me historically, but then I want you to see in which of the categories might you fit right now. I'll go ahead and tell you up front, there's some you don't want to fit into, but you may. And we believe here at Rabbit Creek, as we should based on Scripture, we we don't believe in shame. We sing about shame has no place in the gospel. But we believe in conviction. And so you might receive some conviction today. That's not to say, oh, how poorly you're acting and oh, woe is you. What we're talking about is the fact that God can restore you and bring you into a position that you should be. And the first thing that we see are the critics. The critics. Chapter 2, verse 10. When Sambalot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Benjamin Franklin said that there are at least two things that you can be guaranteed of, death and taxes. Death and taxes, right? Guaranteed. I want to add to that, death, taxes, and critics. Death, taxes, and critics. If you have the most wonderful humanitarian idea, if you have the great pursuit that will fix all, which you don't have, but if you have something that is beautiful, one or more, most likely more, critics will raise their voices and say, you're an idiot, you haven't thought that out well, that's not going to work. Critics are going to be a part of your life. And notice the progression. I'm going to go on in the text here in a minute. Verse 10, they're just kind of grumbling. Ammonite official. We see him. We see Sam Blot. We see others. Coming and saying, what you're doing is foolish. And, and they accuse him of treason, basically. As later on we'll see people doing to Jesus. They accuse them of saying, what are you doing? Standing up against the king? Forgetting the king's the one that sent him to do this job. But... That's where it begins, it's ridicule, criticism, verbal criticism. But notice how they raise the ante, they, they turn up the heat. In verse 19 it says this, But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Gershom the Arab heard about this, about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. So it begins with more of a mild questioning. But then it becomes an all-out verbal attack. Do we have any verbal attack going on in our nation right now? (laughs) Just a little bit. On the national scale, we have verbal attack. Long gone are the days where you simply stand on a platform and say, I believe in this, please vote for me. Now it's the person next to me is an absolute idiot, run in fear, right? Something like that. But that's easy to pick on. We, We see this in our own journeys where we are either being criticized or we are the critics. We are the perpetrators sometimes, or we're the recipients of the criticism. And so don't get too comfortable here identifying critics yet because you might identify yourself. Okay? Be careful there. And sometimes we have both hats. Sometimes we are very critical of others. I found this very interesting, and it's all anonymous, so don't worry. But the way the app is designed... Uh, the Bible app that you have, which is also our app, if, you, if you're on this, we have about 80 or so people signed up for that. And you who have been honest, because you receive Scripture every day, they have an assessment that helps them know what kind of Scriptures to send you. And so you fill out some things that you might be tempted with, some things you struggle with. And again, I have no idea who you are, so don't start sweating. Don't worry about it. It's anonymous. They just give me numbers, not names. I received an email, an update from the, the Bible um, industry or or business ministry that that sends me the information. Number one issue in Rabbit Creek, at least among those who are honest about it, number one issue, nearly half 
of those 80 people have said, I struggle with criticizing others. Thank you for your honesty. So we're not just preaching to the choir here. We're embracing this as a struggle that we have. So if, that's, if you're one of those 40 plus people that uh, have honestly confessed that, look at this. See what the harm that comes out of this. And, and if you don't struggle with this, continue to pray that you won't struggle with this. There is a wonderful assurance that God is going to be with us even when the critics are with us. I want to continue on in the text, but before we do, I want us to look to what Paul assured of us. Jesus assured us that in this world we will have trouble. We're going to come back to that in the following weeks. But Paul, a follower of Jesus, he continues with this journey, this words of Jesus, and tells us how to handle this. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for in the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not, what? Give up. You will reap a harvest, a beneficial harvest. You will bear fruit, as John 15, 5 says. In Galatians, it's put from the perspective, in Paul's words, through a harvest. If you will be patient, if you will be faithful, if you will trust in God, here's what I want you to do, God helping you, take your everyday ordinary life. If you will trust in God, you will bear fruit. You will receive a harvest because you have been faithful to God. But notice what is the prerequisite to that. Don't give up. Don't give up. Do not become weary in doing good. Do not become weary in doing good. You are going to have to be diligent. You're going to have to be determined to overcome. You're going to have to be determined to do that which God has called you to do. Now, this transition next to the next category, I want you to hold on that phrase I just said because it's very important. That you need to overcome your critics, be determined to override their mockery and other things to do what God has called you to do. What God has called you to do. Hold on to that phrase. So in that, we talk about critics, and then we move on to what I've called the conductors. The conductors, you can call them the leaders, you can call those that lead the way, those that say, here we are, here we go, captain, soldier, general, master, call them what you will. I've chosen conductor. And we find Nehemiah conducting the whole arrangement. He has prepared, he has acted, and we find in verses 17 and 18 what he's telling us. He says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. I want to share with you some things that H.I. Hester says that God had, or excuse me, that, uh, that Nehemiah had. Before I do that, I want you to notice in the scripture some very important things. Notice what he does for the people. First, he lays out the problem. Last week we talked about you got to create your own crisis sometimes. Make it a crisis for yourself so you would do something about this. He is making it their crisis. This is your crisis. You live here. Help me fix this issue. And then he goes to his endorsements, to put it lightly. I'm going to lead you in this. So he said, here's the problem. Don't be afraid. I'm going to lead you in this. Reminds me of Deborah, the, the great prophetess, the, the one who is going to lead the people. And here is Nehemiah. And he says, here's the problem. I'm going to go with you. Recently listening to the difference between uh, Queen Elizabeth of many years ago and Napoleon. And Queen Elizabeth stood before her soldiers and said, I'm ready to go into this battle with you. And she referred to herself as a, as a weak female woman. That's how she referred to herself. And she said, but I'm here with you. I am with you. Napoleon basically said, I'm going to do my job. You're going to die and I'm going to write about it. That's what basically said. I'm going to survive so I can record this for history. That was Napoleon standing with his troops. Okay, this is not Nehemiah's tact. He says, I am going to be with you. I'm going to do this. But then he says, endorsements, God's with me, and so is the king. God's with me, and so is the king. So H.I. Hester identifies at least four things that Nehemiah presented here, and that is business judgment, wise leadership, great patience, and determination. I want you to look at those words. 
Look at them. We see that we have business judgment, wise leadership, great patience, and determination. Think about what's going on in your world and see if you can apply each of those. One quarter of that, one third of that, one half of that. None of that will really be what you need. You need all four, four of four. You need these. If the word business scares you, replace it with something else. But you need that good judgment. You need to have good judgment. You need it. And you need to have this wise leadership. Notice not just leadership. It's, it's been popular for at least 20 years, the idea of servant leadership. And that's important. We want to continue to pour that out. It's a biblical concept. But servant leadership does not negate the need for wisdom. Some people say, I'm such a servant, I don't need to really plan on this. I'm just going to go into it because I don't want to be in anybody's way. If you're in a leadership position, can I say buck up? Can I say that? If you're in a leadership position, buck up. Use not only your power that God has given you, your influence, but be wise about it. Your judgment, your wisdom, patience. Particularly if you're the leader, be patient with those around you. And then determination, because guess what? If you're the leader and you give up, Guess who else is going to give up? Everybody following you. Why do we all like those movies? The one I always think of is Mel Gibson in the uh, Braveheart movie. And, and it, he's going up and down in front of the troops and yelling these wonderful things. And I can't do that as well as he did. But he inspires the troops. I'm with you. This is your moment. That's what you need to be as a leader. You don't need the blue paint. You don't need the biceps. Don't need the spear. But you need to use what God has given you with all of these things. If you're a conductor, if you're a leader. Verse 20. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim of historic right to it. So what he says is, men, women, followers, I'm with you. God's with us. Critics, get out of here. You've got no part of this. It's leadership. That's what he's doing. Another author points out that he had this true sense of divine support. Now, before we moved to conductors, we were under critics, and I said you need to remember this phrase, what God has called you to do. Be certain. Certain. That if you say, God has called me to do this, that God has called you to do this. There are many things done in the name of God that God has nothing to do with. So wise judgment, the first of the four, begins with the understanding that God is really with me in this. It's like the young man who comes up to his love of his life, his, his girlfriend, whatever you want to call her. And he walks up and says, God has told me, and people have tried this, God has told me that we need to get married. Could be true, but guess what? God's got to speak to her too, right? Right? Or, or God has told me to build this house, or God has told me to go and do A, B, C, X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Make sure before you put God's name on it, that it deserves God's name. Please don't go claiming to other people, particularly non-believers, that God's called you to do something. If you're not sure that God has indeed called you to do it. That's so necessary for us to understand. Psalm 32, 8. Here's how you find out. God says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Once you hear from God, once you're utterly certain, God's going to say, I've called you, you're going, and I'm going to bless you. There are plenty of people that have jumped off in some endeavor and said, I'm with God, and God says, I didn't say anything about that. And so he's not with us in that. He still loves us, yes. Still protects us, perhaps. <laughs> But he's not going to give you the strength and the endurance and the wisdom if you're going off in a different direction that he's called you not to do. Be absolutely certain. 
Offer your bodies a living sacrifice is holy and pleasing to God. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his holy, pleasing, and perfect will. Take your everyday, ordinary life and place it before God. Take your lives, live them down, place them down as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Then you will know. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. We talked about critics. We talked about conductors. We also need to talk about the craftsmen. The people that actually execute the plan. So perhaps this is somewhat the conductor, but beyond the conductor, these are the men, the women, those around you who are doing the task with you and for you. These are the people with the skill to execute the plan. I found a leak in a bathtub yesterday. If I try to fix that, that's going to turn out to be about a six, seven hundred, two thousand dollar job. If a plumber comes and fix that, Lord willing, it's going to be two, three hundred. I don't know. If I mess with it, I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to make it worse. Some, he'll start linking on the other tub. And so if you're not a craftsman in one area, don't mess with it. Some of you may be saying, God's called me to do this, and, and somebody next to you can say, no, he hasn't, because you're not gifted in that area. <laughs> I'm not sure if Steve's in here. He'll be back in the next service. You're here. I'm, I'm still mad at you. Uh, you asked me to sing a solo one time. You remember that? Okay. Uh, brutally honest. Good, bad. Come on. Did I sing well or not well? I know you work for me, but come on, okay? I, I won't let you answer that out loud. He's like, hey, this is a manual I passed you before. He was working with me. He's ministering with me. And he's like, this would be so great. You could get up and sing a solo. And I sang a solo. It was awful. We didn't have cameras in our church. Praise God. <laughs> it was awful. That's not my gift. I'm not a craftsman of song. If someone's standing next to me singing on tune, I will sing it. When one of these beautiful singers goes a different direction, I go with them. And I'm, oh, I can't reach that note. Okay? So what's your gift? Use it. Don't, not a gift. Don't use it. Let's, let's check this out. Wonderful thing about these, these craftsmen, these individuals who are doing the work in a great way. We find through all of chapter 3 this great listing of people who did such and so. And one author says that they are truly monotonous. You'll get the passages and you're saying, wow, why is this so important? Name did this, such and so did this, who and so, whatever. And this is very monotonous, but it has a point. Because it's a group of co-laborers, people taking their everyday, ordinary life. Listen to these few passages out of chapter 3. I'm not going to bore you by reading all of chapter 3. You'll go to sleep on me, and I won't be able to pronounce about half the names. We're just going to skim through chapter 3 by looking at a few verses. Verse 8, Uziel, son of Hanai, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs next to that. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Verse 28. Above the horse gate, the priest made repairs, each in front of his own house. Verse 32. And between the room, above the corner, and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants made repairs. Goldsmiths, merchants, priests. Lawyers, physicians, moms, dads, bankers, electricians, technicians, child care workers. Whatever you are, God has given you a gift. And sometimes, not contradicting what I said moments ago, but sometimes God will stretch you a little bit and bring you out of a gift set into another gift set you never knew you had. We talk about at Rabbit Creek, everyone should serve. Everyone's a minister. We talked about that last week. One of the phrases we like to kick around is you serve first where you're gifted, serve second where you're needed. So first where you're gifted, second where you're needed. Throughout my ministry, at different times, I've, I've done things with children's ministry. I love children, not just my own. I love children. And I can help teach an exhibition day camp lesson, or I can help do this and that. But that's not my calling. I'm not going to do children's ministry all the time. 
So you need to share and gift. But check this out. I've read through chapter 3 like you have perhaps, or you just skipped it because like, this is boring. But, but check this out. Perfume makers built the wall. Perfume makers built the wall? Are you kidding me? Perfume makers built the wall? Are you feeling unqualified? Think about these people. I just make perfume, Nehemiah. How am I supposed to build a wall? We have youth, including my daughter, that are now in New Mexico. They were in West Texas and Amarillo. And I laugh because it's the work team that goes down. And, and they talk to these teenagers and say, okay, you're going to tear down this wall, redo this pantry, you're going to build another wall. And I'm going, my daughter doesn't know how to do any of that. But I got pictures. The walls look beautiful. Why? Because someone, a leader, a conductor said, craftsman, here's how you do it. Here's how you do it. Perfume makers, for crying out loud, built the wall. Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The quote's been said so many times, nobody knows who said it. I'll say it again. God calls the equipped. God equips the called. God calls the equipped. He equips the called. If he calls you to something, you're most likely equipped in it. But he will call you, and then he'll equip you in the journey. I know my calling. I won't tell the whole story, but my calling to ministry is near and dear to me. Because in difficult times of ministry, my call has held me fast. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying there because God has called me to. This is what I've said to myself in difficult times of ministry. When I began college, God called me into active ministry. Not just the idea of going into ministry someday, but actually being a part of it. And I walked into that church literally on the other side of the tracks in an an environment that I wasn't used to, where I was a year older, one year older than the senior in high school. I was supposed to be his youth minister, not just his buddy. Did I feel equipped? Not at first. But God called me there, so he equipped me. Did I make mistakes? Yes. You're going to make mistakes. But if God calls you to something, do it. So we talk about these wonderful, wonderful people who who craft things. We talk about these conductors. We, We talk about those who criticize. And then we talk about just maybe the most disappointing group, bunch in the whole group. And that is the cavalier. Those that just sit back and watch. As others do. Verse 5, chapter 3. The next section was prepared by the men of Tekoa. Way to go, men of Tekoa. Remember that comma but I talked about last week? Usually means rest of the story. Sometimes good, this is not good. Comma but. Their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. Nobles under the two words that (laughs) never shall meet in their minds. Maybe some of you are not going to what God's called you to do, either primarily or secondarily, because you're too proud to go there. Because you're too proud to go there. Maybe it's beneath you. This is what these nobles felt. (laughs) Building a wall. My my skills can be used so much better as I sit and critique (laughs) Or as I take a nap. Or as I let the other people do it. The nobles would not put their shoulder to the work under the supervisor. Matthew 23. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Nehemiah, I love his confidence based on his faith, based on his knowledge of his own skills. And he says to all who will listen, the God of heaven will give us success. The God of heaven will give us success. 
If you will leave the critical and the cavalier behind and you will be a conductor in some realms of life and a craftsperson in another or maybe a little bit of, the, of both and you know without a doubt that God has called you to do it, he will. He will grant you success. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Everyone should have one of these. If you don't, you're going to receive one here in just a minute. So anybody not have one, we'll get one to you. It's in your blue sheet if you don't know where it is. And we've got some pins right here in the middle. We've got some folks that need it. Thanks, Renee. Anybody else? All right, if you need a pen, let us know also. And here's a little sentence I want you to complete. I want you to complete uh, this sentence. Fill it in. As a blink, I will serve God by blink. Only you can fill this out. So write the sentence with the blanks in it. You're not turning this in. You're not going to put it in the offering plate. You're not going to give it to your neighbor. As a blink, I will serve God by blink. So as a father, happy Father's Day, I will serve God by loving my children. As a boss, I will serve God by treating my employees with integrity. As a husband, I will serve God by loving my wife, by respecting my husband, the wife would say. I, I will, as a, fill in the blank, I will serve God as. And so during this time of worship, I, I invite you uh, to just fill this out. This is for you and God to have a little conversation. This is that time for this. This is for you to say as a, I'll serve God by. I want you to fill this out and put it somewhere where you will not lose it. Those of you more apt to lose it. You've got a neat thing in your pocket, I'm assuming, that takes pictures. Take a picture of it. Digitally, you'll have this wherever you go. I want you to fill this in and just say, as a blank, I will serve God by blank. It's your time. Use it well. And during this time, if you need prayer to help you with this, some of our pastors, some of our prayer team will be around this room. So if you're a pastor or part of our prayer team, um, Please do this, and we'll grant you time, another time to fill this card out. Uh, but, but make sure that uh, you are available, folks, to pray. You see I'm standing up here. Find one of these men, find one of these women uh, to pray with if, if you need this time. So during this worship, fill this out. As you've completed it, spend time in prayer, spend time singing, spend time celebrating, uh, whatever God has called you to do. Let's continue. Working.